This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, all, all this um, links up um, uncannily to, to Sir Edgar Spire, um, a character who I'd never heard of a few years ago, but um, I became very interested in, in the case, the, the trial which um, befell him in 1921. Uh, I have to say, I should say straight away that um, Edgar Speyer was was not an enemy alien. He was a naturalized British subject with exactly the same rights as any other British subject. However, this this didn't help him in the end. Edgar Speyer, um, who was he? He was a merchant banker uh, of German parentage with a, with a brother in, in New York and a brother-in-law in Frankfurt. There were three banks. They were related to each other, but independent. All three brothers, brother-in-law, were members of each other's bank uh, partners. The brother-in-law in Frankfurt was also honorary British consul in that city in the happy days before the war when Anglo-German relations, however uh, fluctuating, were not so bad that you couldn't have a, a chap being honorary consul who was a German subject. Okay, um, Spire, uh, Spire's bank, um, Ed, Edgar was, was chairman of Spire Brothers in London. He, in 1902, he founded the Underground Electric Railways Company of London, which financed the digging of the deep level tubes and the electrification of the lines. So without Edgar, there simply would be no, no underground, no tube. He accumulated, he um, took over control of all the other underground lines. He expanded them and he also took over the buses and eventually the tramways. So uh, by 1914, he really was, he was called King of King of London Transport. An important figure in British, in London society. He, in 1902, he rescued the proms, the promenade concerts from um, bankruptcy. Out of his own pocket, he uh, founded a new company, the Queen's Hall Company Limited, him, with himself as chairman. Edgar was passionately interested in music. Um, he was friends with uh, numerous well-known composers and musicians of the day, Elgar, Grieg, Richard Strauss, um, Percy Granger, Debussy and others, and of course um, was a, a very much a friend of Henry Wood. I mean, he, he, Edgar was the patron of Henry Wood, and together they decided what was going to be on the programmes, and Edgar wanted to make of the proms the equivalent of, of a German musical institution. Before that, it was a bit of a vaudeville, bit of light music, some serious pieces thrown in, but Edgar said this has to be serious, classical, but modern music, uh, up-to-date music, for the public at a price that they can afford. And he personally subsidized, subsidized the proms from 1902 to 1914 when he was kicked out out of his own pocket. He founded, uh, he co-founded and patronized the Whitechapel Art Gallery. He was a notable philanthropist. He put money into, he gave money to the Edward VII Hospital, to the Poplar Hospital. He rescued a penny bank that went bust and reimbursed all the poor local folk who put their sixpence a week into this bank in Suffolk. He helped to finance the both of Captain Scott's expeditions and on the failure of the last one, he um, helped to raise funds for the dependents and for what later became the Scott, Mem uh, uh, Scott Memorial Inst Research Institute in the University of Cambridge. On the eve of, the, of war, nobody could have been a happier man, one would have thought, than Edgar Spire. He was a personal friend, he was a liberal in politics, a personal friend of the Asquiths who, and who dined in there in 10 Downing Street frequently, and he was made a baronet and a privy councillor. So all this um, comes to a sudden end in, uh, after the 4th of August 
1914, when Edgar Spire becomes, um, falls very rapidly from favor. Uh, very rapidly, within a fortnight of the declaration of war, there's a letter in the Times uh, demanding that Edward stand down immediately from uh, anything to do with the proms. Uh, he's accused of being a, a German, which, which he was. Um, uh, one of those people who uh, with bought honours, purchased honours, yes, who with control over our transport system, very dangerous in time of war. Incidentally, the Metropolitan Police were sent down with flashlights to look down the tunnels to see if there weren't any spies or gunpowder being, you know, Guy Fawkes, that kind of thing, um, because all of these uh, the lines were under the control of Edgar Spire. It didn't help having the name Spire, 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 and still less did it help that his telegraphic address was Spy London. He had a, <laughs> a country house, seaside house, <coughs> overlooking the sea at Overstrand on the east coast. And um, we've heard about the denunciations to the police. There were many such from locals both there and at his mansion <coughs> in the Grosvenor Street in Mayfair in London. And people were saying they've got wireless there uh, and um, on the seaside that cars are turning up in the middle of the night with he headlight, glaring headlights out to sea, which may well have been true. Anyway, uh, because of the ships uh, going down, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Abukir and the Cressy and the Hogue going down in September 1914, and later the German bombardment of um, Great Yarmouth, uh, the locals said, look, it's perfectly obvious. Uh, the, the Royal Navy, we are betrayed. And um, the betrayer is this man here with the house overlooking the sea. Um, further credence was given to this idea by the fact, by, by the suggestion, that Edgar and his wife were dining far too frequently with the Prime Minister and that on one occasion Asquith, uh, whether um, from too much drinking or whatever, had let slip the position of the British fleet, and that was why the fleet was nowhere to be seen. So um, there was a certain fatal plausibility about these these rumours, which which did for for Edgar. Now I said he wasn't an enemy alien; he was a naturalised British citizen. But the a campaign was begun by certain politicians on the right wing of the con extreme right wing of the Conservative Party and by the press, primarily the Northcliffe Press and also the, the Morning Post, to say, look, at the end of the day, what's the difference? Is there really a difference between an enemy alien and a naturalised uh, British citizenship of German parentage with a brother in New York and a brother-in-law in Frankfurt. What they said was these people, people like Spire, ought to be uh, interned before anybody else, as much as or, uh, like any, any, any enemy alien, because uh, they said blood is thicker than water and so on, and his connections are far too dangerous to this country. Um, the, the press campaign against him was of uh, a, a vitriol that, that makes your hair stand on end even today. Um, and uh, it, what I want, what came, became clear to me is this, that of all the people who were um, the target of anti-German uh, suspicion and prejudice mm -hmm. and hatred during the First World War, Spire, whose name, as I said, I never heard of, came at the top of the list. But you may say, well, that, that's rubbish, because what about Battenberg, Prince Louis? Yes, that's another story. What about Haldane, the pro-German? That's another story. By 1918, both uh, pe people like uh, Battenberg and Sir Ernest Castle, they had been, they had been vindicated. Um, they were back in favour again. You remember that the king immediately disapproved of him of Battenberg being treated like that and made him, um, gave him the, 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 the order of merit, no, sorry, made him a privy councillor to show what he, the king, thought about. The king himself said, look, uh, I'm a German, my family's German, my wife's German, so intern me if you want. That was his attitude. Um, right, so Edgar is, is the prime uh, target of um, anti-German prejudice and 
This is reflected in the legislation which comes about in 1918, the British Nationality and Status of Aliens Act. This was intended to deprive people who had certificates of naturalization of their British citizenship. Before that, it was legally, it was physically, it was impossible to do that. Under that act, in 1918, it became possible to do it. This also chimed in um, with Lloyd George's electoral, electoral campaign of the, the coupon election of December 1918. Everybody remembers the slogans, hang the Kaiser and uh, make Germany pay, but it's not quite so, um, it's not quite so well known that the third slogan was get rid of the enemy alien. So Spire was, was very much top of the list and the legislation was very much framed with him in mind. Yes, they said there are heaps of others, but he is the most outstanding candidate. In 19, this is in 1918. In 1921, three years after the war, under that legislation, a tribunal of inquiry is set up to look into the cases of people who've got naturalization to see whether it was um, conducive to the public good. The, the, those are the, the words of the act, uh, and they still are, as a matter of fact. Those are the, that's the criterion which the Home Secretary uses when she's considering whether somebody should de be deported or not. So the act was, um, the tribunal was set up under the act, but it wasn't really a and a tribunal of inquiry at all. It was nothing more or less than a state trial under a high court judge. And after 11 days of um, inquisition, of trial, uh, the tribunal recommended to the Home Secretary found that um, Sir Edgar Spire has been um, disloyal to the Crown in word and in deed, that he has... Um, communicated and traded with the enemy, that he has um, expressed himself in disloyal terms, that he has um, given up any real allegiance, that he's a pro-German, and finally that they recommended that it was not conducive to the public good that he retain his um, certificate of naturalization. So all this time after the war, you can't say it's in the heat of anti-German passion during the war, but after the war, Edgar Speyer, uh, his certificate of naturalization scored out and he is deprived of his uh, privy councillorship. Uh, he was, by this time, he left exactly 100 years ago, 1915, he went to America, but he was brought back again, or told, in, summoned back again in 1921. So he was thrown out. His wife, stripped of her British citizenship, because, uh, as we've heard, uh, w w a wife took her husband's citizenship in those days. Finally, the, the, the daughters, the three little, gir little girls in 1914, they, I think the eldest was 11, and two younger ones, um, they too, they, they were born, born British, but nevertheless it was recommended to the Home Secretary who had the final decision that they too should be, should lose their citizenship. So off they went as well. Finally, uh, returning to governesses, um, there was, there was a governess, uh, a Fräulein Klock. Fräulein Klock was, um, uh, as we've just recently heard, uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to be in London in 1914. That's what Edgar said. It was hard for any German to be in London at that time. So he arranged for her to return home to Kiel. But um, one of the things that emerged in, in his trial, which absolutely flabbergasted the judge, was that while uh, Edgar was in America, or when he got to America and had settled down a bit, he got Fräulein Klock to, to cross the Atlantic and come in and take over the jobs, uh, that she, job that she was doing before. So the judge said, well, how did, how did you communicate with her? So he said, oh, I sent a cable and signed it Edgar Spire. So it sort of sucks to you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs>